good evening, everyone. I, I'm uh, George Craw, and uh, I have the pleasure of welcoming you tonight to our second series of uh, science and technology lect lectures, uh, which feature the very fine, very important work that's being done by our scientists and technologists at UC Santa Cruz. Tonight we'll be talking about nanotechnology, which is a best, I guess, described as human-made, molecule-sized machines that emulate nature. Um, it's a very, very cool area, I guess, is the best way of describing it in the vernacular. Um, our first speaker is going to be Rob Curry, who is, um, he's currently our chief technology officer but uh, at Santa Cruz, um, and he's gonna set the stage for us. Um, he, uh, Rob, was a software uh, builder here in, in, in the Valley for 25 years, worked on uh, things as uh, diverse as uh, how to record uh, winning films or how to figure out the best way to get from San, uh, San Jose to San Francisco. Um, I think I know the answer to that, Rob, actually. It's a helicopter. <laughs> Uh, while we're waiting for the flying cars to show up. Um, and then last year he met UC Santa Cruz professor David Housley and, and they decided to make a turn uh, and to focus on software that would help uh, human health directly via uh, genomics. And our, our featured speaker is, is uh, uh, Professor of Biomolecular Engineering Mark Ak Atkinson. And uh, he and I have something in common. We both actually majored in European uh, history. But obviously, Mark's career took a little different path than mine, since I'm a lawyer. Um, uh, but, uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, made, uh, as he's, he's making a, a, just a tremendous, uh, tremendous impact on, on, on this field of, field of studies. So I'll uh, turn it over to Rob. Okay. Anybody know what this is? Do you remember this? The IBM 360? I'm probably showing my age. Did you actually program one? Okay. So at the dawn of computing, if you wanted to have access to computing, you had to get access to one of these until these guys came along, right? We know this story. They democratized access to computing by building this thing. And look what happened. It was amazing. Well, history repeats itself. Today, everybody knows what genomics is, right? You've got DNA. If you want to find out what's going on in your DNA, what's going on in cancer, you have to have access to one of these. Very expensive. And only a very small percentage of the planet gets access to that. Until these guys came along. <laughs> and this thing. I'm privileged to introduce this side of the pair, Mark Akison, who, as I said, got a, uh, he's a fine connoisseur of the UC system. He got a BA in uh, European history from UC San Diego, mm -hmm. and then went up to Davis and got a PhD in soil microbiology. I know that makes a lot of sense, most, most <laughs> people do. And then did a fellowship at the NIH. Uh, but then he came to UC Santa Cruz, where he leads the nanopore group. And the nanopore group is where the technology behind this was invented, a USB-sized gene reader. This will democratize access to genomics. So what does that mean? Or like, democratize access to genomics. Remember back in the days when computers were computing, right? People thought it was going to be access uh, recipes in your, in your kitchen. That was what everybody thought a personal computer was. Well, this allows us to get a handle on Ebola in the field at the point of origin. It also is going to allow us to extend UCSF class cancer therapy to everybody on Earth. Um, and also, as you'll see, sequence in space. And ultimately, will allow software to eat medicine. <laughs> Mark. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you all and uh, coming out on a night when the Warriors are playing. If somebody <laughs> leaps up and starts saying yes, I'll assume it was for one of my slides. Uh, so, um, 
See if I can figure this out. This is the, 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 the figure that is sort of the foundation for what we're doing. And, and the reason I'm using it here is that it's a technology that's a merger of computer science, electrical engineering, and biochemistry to read DNA at angstrom precision in real time. And so it required putting all those things together to engineer this amazing device. So before I go into the device per se, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about DNA so everybody's on, this, on the same page. Um, DNA is a strand of polymer. It's a, a bunch of uh, sugars connected by phosphate, and each of those phosphates has a negative charge. And the sugars each have a base on them, the G, A, T, and C. So if you're looking along one strand, it'll be G, A, T, C, so forth, it has a reverse complement, uh, a copy that goes the opposite way. So if it's a G here, it has a C here, a T and an A, and so forth. When your cells divide, along comes an enzyme, cut, an enzyme called a helicase that makes a little bubble in that DNA. And enzymes called polymerases copy each of the two. The cell divides, and then you've got a complete set of chromosomes in each cell. This material is incredibly dense information. In your body, every cell, and you've got 100 trillion of them, has 6 billion base pairs of DNA about six feet long per cell, condensed into five micrometers. So it's probably, arguably, the most dense information on the planet. And so you might think, well, in this room, that's a lot of DNA. And in fact, it's dwarfed by the total amount of DNA on the planet. <clears throat> and if you calculate that, as some co colleagues in the Netherlands did, it comes out to about 10 to the 37th DNA bases total. You may be thinking, what on how much is that? And if you take uh, supercomputers, which have about a 3,000 square foot footprint, it takes 10 to the 22nd power of those to equal that amount of data storage. And so you'd cover the Earth 10 billion times with those supercomputers to match this. So when people ask, well, how long are people going to sequence DNA uh, as long as we exist? <clears throat> So a little bit of background, I'm going to take three minutes to, to lead you through DNA sequencing up to the point where we are now. This is a curve that shows, I like to just point, there's a fancy pointer which will confuse me. Um, this is years on this axis, and that's the cost per human genome. So at the very top, in about 1977, it was infinitely expensive. At the bottom is about $1,000. This guy, Fred Sanger, first uh, deciphered the uh, amino acid sequence of insulin. That was his first Nobel Prize. A few years later, he decided, I think I'll work on DNA sequencing. He invented the technology <clears throat> that basically was used for the first human genome. Um, so just an incredible inventor, um, two Nobel Prizes. <clears throat> what arose from that was the data that was used to assemble the first human genome in the year 2000. <clears throat> and that assembly took place at UC Santa Cruz. This is Jim Kent, who it turns out was from Silicon Valley. He was a computer scientist, as is often the case, decided he wanted to do biology and came to the Santa Cruz campus. So that was in 2000. Move forward a little bit, <clears throat> over time, this is Moore's law, the white line. You see it decreasing in cost. This is actually an exponent. This is a log, cur log um, curve. The DNA sequencing with Sanger followed that curve because robotics and computer science kept getting better and better and cheaper. But in 2007, things exploded with these uh, devices, for example, Illumina, a great technology, that uh, did massively parallel sequencing. So imagine a slide, like you used as a kid to look at in a microscope, that had 10 million beads on it, and each of those beads had a little fragment of DNA. And so you would sequence one base at a time, but on 10 million beads, and so forth and so on. So it became, uh, even the exponent was even steeper, and has been driven down to on the order of $3,000 per base pair. And so you might ask, uh, Will this trend continue? And the answer is in two parts. I just told you there are 10 to the 37th bases to go. We've done, we just scratched the surface. 
And the other is that DNA is arguably <clears throat> the most important molecule in the universe. And if there are any astrophysicists, they're, they're likely to jump up and disagree with me. But if you think about it, the, the, the DNA encodes neurons. And the neurons in your brain are what allow astrophysicists to uh, imagine <laughs> to imagine why I'm wrong. But beyond that, also to imagine what it is about why, for example, time is mutable and how things, what's taking place billions of light years away. So DNA encodes that information in neurons. So very important molecule. There's so much to do on the planet. This rate of, of improvement will never stop. All right. So along comes, in 1989, my colleague, Dave Deemer, who is now an emeritus professor at UC Santa Cruz. And he was driving along Interstate 5, coming back from Oregon. And he started to think about how he could make a protocell, an early cell, and he needed to get ATP inside of it. So he needed a little channel. And as he was driving along Interstate 5, he started to think, wait a minute, what if I take a string of these mononucleotides, DNA, and run it through that channel, I wonder if I could sequence DNA. So he pulls over to the side of the road, literally, and drew this picture, which is the foundation of this concept so many years later. Dave is still active at UC Santa Cruz, by the way. <clears throat> OK, so the concept is really straightforward, which is one of the beautiful things about it. This is a thin film about 50 angstrom thick. That film is equivalent to what surrounds all of your cells in your body. So into that, you pop a little hole that's a nanometer across, made of protein, or if it's in solid state, you mill it with an elect uh, uh, electron beam. And you toss in salt. You could do this with ocean water. We could go out in Santa Cruz, get a, you know, a few mil uh, milliliters of, of ocean water, and run this experiment. Uh, but anyway, we use monovalent ions. And then when you apply a voltage with a battery, you can imagine, these ions move through the pore. The positive ion moves towards the negative electrode, and the negative uh, chloride moves towards the positive electrode. And so you get a steady state current. DNA is a polymer of anions. So when you apply that voltage, it gets caught in the hole. And as it goes through, it impedes the ionic current in a, in a way that's characteristic for each base. So that's the basic idea. So uh, what made Dave think this could potentially work and the rest of us? And it's in engineering what you call a chips and salsa uh, solution. Are there, if there are engineers here, you're going like, I've never heard of that before. <laughs> but it's basically taking one wonderful concept, another wonderful concept, and putting them together in an inventive way. And from that comes something really special. And so what are the things that were put together? One is electronics that dates back to the 1930s, something called a voltage clamp amplifier. And this basic idea, I don't want to go through a lot of detail because um, we'll have to go watch the Warriors play later. But the basic idea is what was used in the 1950s by Hodgkin and Huxley to decipher something called an action potential. So in your neurons, there are processes that propagate a signal stimulated by another neuron, propagates that signal along the axon, uh, and it's called an action potential. And they used that device in the 1950s that we're using now in these devices. So something really powerful and very reliable. And the next was that the ion flux, the uh, movement of ions through these pores, because the electric field is very strong, is very high. So if you do it, you calculate flux in terms of area, millimeters squared and seconds, it's about 10 to the 20th particles. Um, how, what does that mean? If you scale this up, it's equivalent to a lightning bolt. So basically, you have a, uh, this circuit that's very reliable, and you have a lightning bolt on the nanoscopic scale. All right. So there we are. But not everybody found this argument persuasive. And our colleague at Harvard, a guy named Dan Branton, 
We call him Daniel Webster because he's so articulate. Um, would go, he'd be, we, 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 people would say, this, is, uh, this will never work. And he'd ask them, is it impossible? Tell me based on first principles why this cannot work. And what people would respond is, it's not impossible, it's just too hard. And it was too hard. Imagine that you have to capture this big polymer in a hole that is basically a nanometer across. And once you do that, it has to thread through that hole in one direction, and every one of these bases has to go in single file order. It can't fold back on itself, because if it does that, you're messed up. You can't sequence. You have to control at angstrom scale millions and millions of times in series. And then you need a sensor that's about 10 angstrom long. So the, it was a very challenging problem. So we and our colleagues set about trying to solve this. This shows the first resolution. We, de we determined by a variety of experiments that the DNA actually went through these holes, these protein holes, in single file order. There was lots of experiments that did this. This is called molecular dynamic simulation. All atoms are basically asking the question, if you apply voltage in this model, how does it behave? And you can see it basically files through as exactly as we needed it to. So we proved that point, we and our colleagues. And next was an angstrom scale sensor. You needed to devise something that was about 10 angstrom long. And a variety of our colleagues did this. Uh, this is an example from a, a protein in E. coli. In your system, there's a lot of E. coli. And all of them have this channel. And so they basically used this channel as a DNA sensor with this constriction about 10 angstrom long. So solving that second problem. The third problem was the hardest one. And this is what we focused on for about 10 years. And I'm going to show you three slides. 10 years condensed into three slides. But basically, this was a, an image or a, a, a movie of real data taken in uh, 1999. And it shows each of these downward deflections is a long strand of RNA going through that pore. It goes through so fast that it's basically two microseconds per nucleotide. And that is too fast to resolve with this sensor. So we had to do something about that. And the solution was to come up with some sort of nanoscale machine that would regulate that motion. And so in 1999, 2000, people were devising sort of silicon-based uh, nanoscopic motors. This was someone's vision, a guy na named Twibble. Somebody may know who this person is better than I do. But basically, a little tank made of silicon and oxygen. We're biochemists. And we had the advantage of knowing that nature has been building these nanoscopic machines for three billion years. And, and basically doing countless experiments to ask the question, how can I copy DNA, move DNA, et cetera, uh, at high efficiency, exactly right? And so the biochemist, that's us, came to the fore. And I'm showing an example of one uh, machine that I'm not using here, but it's relevant because in a month there's going to be a big party here for this guy, Harry Noller, from our campus, who got the Breakthrough Prize in 2000 uh, this year um, for the studying something called the ribosome, which is arguably the most fantastic machine in the universe. Everything is on a universal scale when I talk. <laughs> so, uh, so this I'm going to go through this animation one more time. I, I've just shown it to you, but it shows something in the ribosome called accommodation. We'll re, it'll reboot in a second. And so what you're looking at is the ribosome. This is from crystal structures. There's two subunits sitting around mRNA, and this is a tRNA molecule probing for the exact fit on messenger RNA. If it fits just so, the RNA, the ribosome, and the tRNA send a message a great distance away, 80 angstrom. On this kind of thing, it's a long way. And it causes this enzyme associated with the tRNA to dissociate. You'll, you'll see this in a moment. It's beautiful to the people like me. And then off it goes. And once it dissociates, the tRNA accommodates into this position to add an amino acid to the protein. 
And in your body right now, this is being done millions and millions of times to make, uh, make, make protein out of, uh, encoded by messenger RNA. That's a machine you can come back next month and hear about it. Yes, yes please, yeah, please do. And so uh, this is the machine we actually use. This is how DNA is replicated in your body. This is an animation uh, that's uh, realistic. And basically, a helicase is unzipping the DNA. And then in each of these uh, components, it's copying a, a, a template strand into a daughter strand in two directions. So the helicase is one of the motors we use, and the other is a polymerase. And this is, uh, I mean, literally in your body going on at, a, at just rocket speed in all those hundred trillion cells. So imagine, you know, imagine we would all combust or something. There's so much going on. <laughs> so, we then, so we went up the, the, the road to Stanford. We have friends at Stanford. We like them. And uh, the first DNA polymerase was discovered by a guy named Arthur Kornberg, who got the Nobel Prize for this back in the 50s. And it, uh, a fragment of that is called the Klenow fragment. It's part of that polymerase. So we said, let's try that. Let's see how that works. And uh, very disappointing. So this is an experiment. This is time on this axis. And that's picoampers of current. And we're basically asking the question, how well does this polymerase hold on to DNA when the electric field, the nanopore, is pulling on it? You want that to stay there permanently. And it was off in an instant, basically quicksilver through your fingers. It was gone. So we tried a variety of enzymes. They all failed. And if that continued, this entire process would have been set back decades. And yet we persevered. And a colleague of ours in Spain, Margarita Salas, she's a National Academy member from Madrid, had for, ye for years studied this enzyme uh, from a, a virus, Phi29 DNA polymerase. And so it's an amazing um, uh, enzyme because it forms a donut around the DNA. And so this donut, predictably, would not dissociate as easily. And so we ran that experiment and compared it. And the retention by this enzyme on top of the pore was about uh, three orders of magnitude better. So if you're a young student and you ask the question, is three orders of magnitude a good difference? Yes, it is. And so that's what we, we uh, went forward with. So at that point, we formed an alliance with the University of Washington and put the enzyme and the pore together. And this is the first public de demonstration in 2012 of nanopore sequencing. And what it's showing is a strand of CAT repeated. And you can see in this pattern that it's a th basically three steps, CAT, 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 with one G inserted in the middle for good measure, and then back to CAT, CAT. So it worked, and that was sort of the foundation condensed into one slide for 10 years of effort. Um, meanwhile, in parallel, the company that had licensed the intellectual property from our campus in Oxford, UK, had learned from some of the work we'd done, and, and in parallel was inventing this device. So basically taking the IP from UCSC and building a, a miniaturized device with 500 pores in it that could sequence DNA like uh, nobody's business. And so a day after our poster, uh, this guy Clive Brown, their chief technology officer, gave a talk about this minine. That's basically the forerunner of this one here. And it sent shockwaves through this media, and this is a, a quote in Forbes magazine. And that's literally true. It was a, a crowd of 700 people. And if you've been to a lecture where there's no sound, everyone's so concentrated on what's being said that there's no shuffling at all. And it was 700 people hearing this guy's talk. So how does this thing work? Um, this is an animation basically showing what it does. And this is in um, essentially real time. It's threading DNA through that pore with a motor. It goes around a, a corner, and it reads the other strands. So it's reading the template and daughter strands. And then it repeats. It does this over and over and over again. So it basically reloads. There's not a whole lot of trouble you have to go to. It reads one long strand and leads, reads another. 
So what's, what are some of the things this can do? Uh, there's Dave Deemer in 2014. This is literally the day we first got that device, and he sequenced DNA in a wonderful little space we have uh, tucked away in Jack, Jack Baskin Engineering. So this is uh, one of the virtues of this uh, device is it reads very long pieces of DNA. So this wonderful technology industry leader, Illumina, reads about a 400 base pair fragment. So a dinky little thing, but very well. And so that's represented on here as little pixels of a picture. If you get a lot of those little parts, you get an idea of the picture eventually. The nanopore sequencer can read up to 880,000 base pairs. And so if you think about it, that's basically like this. So if you're walking on the Golden Gate Bridge with your seven-year-old, about four feet tall, that's equivalent to the 400 base pairs. And the 880,000 is equivalent to one end of the Golden Gate to the other. So this tiny device, which weighs 90 grams, can sequence that long a fragment of DNA. And you might ask, why does that matter? Who cares? I mean, whatever. And here's why. There's, ex uh, for example, there are vast areas of your genome that have never been sequenced. You've all heard there's 100,000 human genomes that have been completed. In, in substantial part, that's true. But in reality, that's not true. And some of the regions that have never been sequenced include an area called centromeres, which is where, critical for how chromosomes sort when cells divide. That had never been done until one week ago. And this wonderful scientist, remember this name, Karen Miga, she's a postdoc with David Hauser at UCSC, took some of these long minion reads and for the first time at a meeting in London last week, presented a complete centromere sequence using this technology. And really the sky's the limit with this level of talent and, and this technology. So, uh, for geneticists, genomics people, everyone's high-fiving, this is fabulous, onward, the future is bright. So when I sat down with uh, Rob and another colleague, they, they heard that and said, that's nice, Mark. There was no high-fiving and so forth. And Rob said, what's the killer application of this technology? And what it is, is summarized in this phrase. It's to enable the analysis of any living thing by any person in any environment. And that's effectively what will be done in 10 years from now, whether it's our device or someone who does one like it, you'll find sequencers basically everywhere. For example, uh, Rob talked about this example. Uh, during the last Ebola outbreak, apparently there's another one. Um, traditionally, it took about a year to bring a sample from abroad where one of these outbreaks took place to go through customs and so forth. You can imagine we're bringing Ebola in to the US. Uh, there's, there are gonna be requirements for that. I think the, the original sample brought to New York uh, was brought on an Air Force plane. So it took a year to sequence an Ebola sample simply because getting the sample back to the US took that long. So they and their African colleagues, folks from the UK, took these nanopore sequencing devices to the point of the infections where it was taking place in West Africa and deployed them in Guinea. And within, on baggage stowed in the airplane, it wasn't something fancy. And within two days they, in, in Guinea, they were sequencing Ebola at the point of, of the epidemic and uh, it's only getting better. That, then they, they sequenced 140 samples, and in the future, that'll be thousands and thousands. Uh, a little plug for our treehouse. If you ever have an inclination to be uh, inspired by wonderful women, there's something called the uh, Treehouse Child Cancer Initiative at UCSC. And it's basically a group of women, mothers, whose children had pediatric cancers, or still do, uh, attorneys and scientists who have formed this initiative to basically take genomics, 
to UCSM and Stanford to help diagnose details of pediatric cancers so that they would come up with a treatment for these kids. So their idea is now to expand the reach of places like UCSF and Stanford to uh, all corners of the world, taking this sequencer. So you go to a place, to a kid, who could not realistically get to Stanford or UCSF and be able to sequence the DNA on site, to learn from that. Um, and then the last, in terms of uh, portability, you can't beat this. This is astronaut Kate Rubens, uh, a, f a PhD microbiologist, who put this on a rocket, took it with her uh, to the space station, and used it to sequence DNA. So on Mars missions and so forth, this is likely to be part of the story. And, and you might ask yourself, why do you need to sequence DNA in, a, in, a, in, in, this, in this space station? One, there's radiation damage to everything in that space station. Um, for astronauts going to Mars and so forth, there's a high risk of substantial mutations. And they want to learn how much DNA is damaged in space. The other is they have a limited water supply. All the water is recycled. Urine is converted into drinking water. And so it's very important to know if there are any pathogens cycling in that drinking water. Uh, the other thing is that, believe it or not, there's strange things growing on the walls of the space station. And uh, it's important, uh, potentially, to know what those are. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not something that leaps up and grabs you, but they could be, they, they could be, be dangerous. <clears throat> and so that's sort of the status of this device uh, currently, and uh, UC Santa Cruz has been incredibly supportive of our work. And the combination of uh, our nanoscale engineering and the power of genomics on that campus, which is, if you're a UCSC alum, you should be extremely proud of the genomics community at that campus. It's really absolutely wor world class. I've been to meetings at NIH, Washington, D.C., and so forth, and I introduce myself. You go on a round table. We're all sitting there introducing ourselves. And I'll say I'm from UCSC, et cetera, et cetera. Two people down from me, a director of the National Academy of Sciences, says I'm from UCSC, too. She'd been there years before. So genomics at our campus is astonishing. Uh, with that, uh, I'm happy to answer questions, and uh, thank you. I think we're going to have some mics back here, but why don't we go ahead and start? I think you had your hand up first. Go for it. Um, in a layman's perspective, can you describe how the DNA is transported through the device? Is it in solution form? Or yeah, good question. It's where li DNA likes to be, in solution, in a salt solution like you would find in a cell. And so it's diffusing around in, in water with a few ions to counterbalance the negative charge on, on, the, on the DNA. So yeah, it's in, in the aqueous phase. It's in water. Okay. Whatever, whether it's a blood sample or whatever contains the DNA and you would mix it in the solution? And yeah, yeah you, you, there are a couple of purification steps, but they're getting faster and faster, about 15 minutes uh, to an hour, uh, that you basically purify the DNA and then you put it into solution on top of the device. There you go. Thanks. Yeah. I think back here. Ultimately, Sir? what do you think that this device will cost to produce? Uh, this thing right now costs about $1,000. There's the intent, so if you look at this, you should come up later and, and, and look at it. Um, the, competi the competition is uh, a lot more expensive. That big machine up there is 100000 uh, the, the big, which one? The Pac Bio one? No, that's about $800,000. Okay. The Illumina one, if you buy the full blown thing, is $10 million, something like that. I think, don't quote me on that. I think this is being re recorded. I'll get a, <laughs> an email from Illumina and they'll. But th yeah, this is not. Is, by the way, that, that technology, if, if you send your sequence, your DNA to um, 23andMe, they sequence it with the Illumina device. And so it's a, it's a fantastic thing. I'm not, they're, they're, you should all be clear on that when I say it's too expensive or something. That's, it's well worth it. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, I, I wanted to finish the. So it is. Yeah. It's. I mean, this is not distant future. At a thousand dollars, this technology is going to impact everybody in this room in an epic way in your lifetime, if not in the next five years. If you, if you look, come up later and look at this device, it's got a, a the flow cell that goes inside is a relatively elaborate little piece of electronics. And that is not inexpensive. This is about $600. The intent is to basically port all of this electronics into this thing, this device here, and the chip you put on in is just a little piece of plastic that costs $20. That's the intent. It'll probably actually be 40, but it, it, the intent is 20. <laughs> so, so that's, so it'll, it, there's, there's only one way this technology will go is faster and cheaper, as was the case with electronics in, in Silicon Valley. Let's try from this side of the room over here. Oh, sure. Uh, so you had that uh, amazing graph of Moore's law, right? The cost yeah. of DNA sequencing. Yeah. So right now, how much would this compare with like the Illumina sequence or like a human genome? So uh, I think, so if you amortize an Illumina sequencer, uh -huh. and they should come and present that, but uh, it's about, a, it comes out to about $1,000 spread out over many samples over many years. Mm -hmm. the, according to the company, Oxford Nanopore, they can sequence for about $3,000, but this thing has no, you buy the $1,000 device and there you go. All sequencing is gonna get vast, 10 years from now, you'll look back at, wow, I spent $1,000 on a genome, I was ripped off. <laughs> it's gonna, I, I, the, the, this, that cost is only gonna go down. There'll be a point when it's, um, a commodity. Yeah, I mean, to give you the big Illumina, just like the IBM 360, if you want to do tons and tons of computation, of course, e efficiency of scale, that machine works really well. Um, we were, we're negotiating right now with LabCorp on, you know, how could we have them do processing for the pediatric initiative. If we manage to get our sample in with a pharma sample, which is typically 500 to 1,000 at a time, it's like $800. But if we only wanted to run one, It'd be like running your finances on IBM 360. It'd be astronomical. So really here, this is about you know, being able to make it like the Apple II accessible to everybody. Back here. So um, you have 880,000 base pairs versus 400. Mm -hmm. I'm, I wonder if you could elaborate on that a little bit in terms of why there's that limitation. Or, you know, and then but the second question on mm -hmm. it is, um, how important is it to go further, right? Because I guess there's three billion base pairs yeah. in a human genome, right? Yeah. So, but uh, maybe sure. 880,000 is question. great for yeah. a whole bunch of things, or yeah. So um, the, the, the 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 I th the, the limitations on the on this on the uh, Illumina device, I think, are that after a certain and then you should, again you should have them come and give a talk. Is, is that the, eventually these little beads that they're on and all the sequences that are there get out of phase. And so it, initially you're adding one and they're all in phase, but one misses. And so it adds a, a, a second base that's behind. And so then it becomes sort of convoluted. And so I think that's the basic reason why you can only go so long. How long can you sequence? Well, uh, the question is on, yeah. the, on the Minion device, yes. what sets the 880,000? Oh, right now, that's just because that's the longest anyone's seen yet. That's the longest read. To, we, we typically do about 200,000 base pairs. The limitation on it is basically how big a fragment of DNA you can deliver to the device intact. Okay. And so if you could, this is a goal, if you could deliver an entire chromosome, chromosome is the, the, the entire compact piece of DNA that we all have, we have 23 times two, 46. If you could deliver the entire chromosome, you might be able to sequence that. And that's something that people are attempting to do now. In fact, we intend to. These two guys here work, work in our group. Yeah, I should point out that um, these are two uh, members of the team, the Nanopore team, and they have one running here, and it's sequencing DNA right now. You can look at the blinky lights right here and see that it's actually running. Yeah, that sequenced uh, uh, on coming over in 17. So you imagine it's satellite is one thing, going up to the space station, set, sequencing on 17 is another matter. So, <laughs> so that literally you can sequence DNA on Highway 17 and, and in 10 years we'll all be doing it. Right here, right in the front. Two questions. Oh, one is, what is, my care. Oh, oh, right. oh okay. 
You're like me, you speak loudly. <laughs> yeah. I had to turn this mic down. Uh, two questions. The first question is, what is the level of accuracies you know, when you do the sequencing? Yeah. The second one is, have you tried to sequence RNA through it and do you get as, as accurate? You the, must be a biochemist. Uh, chemistry anyway. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the accuracy, this is, a, this is an interesting story. When we first got these in 2014, the accuracy was not very good. It was about 66%. So one in three times it misread it. And so when we're walking through the hallways at UCSC, these people would, would hear it's two thirds. It's one the third time it's wrong. And they'd be like, that's terrible. Well, we walked by. <laughs> But over the subsequent years, it went up to 75, 85, 92, 95. And so now it's about 95% accurate on the full-length read. Illumina's device is more accurate, so it's a trade-off currently between accuracy and read length. And, it, and, it, and we oftentimes combine the two technologies. But the accuracy keeps going up. Now it's incremental. At first, it was 5%, 5%, and now it's like half a percent because you're getting up to this range where it's, it's hard to squeeze it out. Right. But it only gets better. All of these devices, Illumina and ours and so forth, get better and better over time. Yeah, awesome. What about for RNA sequencing? RNA is going on. We have a paper. I'll send you the PDF. Okay, sounds great. Yeah, you can. You. So d RNA is, for those of you who are not, not biochemists, is the intermediary between DNA and protein. It turns out RNA has a lot of function in cells that is much more complex than people imagined. And so sequencing RNA, its structure, what's there, is the next great endeavor. Right. And, and we, with this device, can do it directly. You just thread it through, and the, and the, the sensor literally touches the RNA or the DNA. And so the, the example I use for people to understand the difference between this and other devices with the optical techniques, the, the camera is up here, and the beads are down here, and, and it's, it does its sequencing. And it's like if I held up a quarter and a penny, and you all said, OK, I can tell that quarter from that penny. And then I said, OK, what's the, what's the, what is the, the feel of the, the perimeter of that quarter? And what does it feel like when I touch George Washington's head on the quarter? And the, the nanopore sequencer literally does that. It touches what goes through it. And so that's, that's why we can sequence RNA directly. It's literally touching the, the Fantastic. RNA. Fantastic. Yeah. That's great. And for, for RNA, job. that the, um, the pediatric, the treehouse group, yeah. yes. so they exclusively have been doing RNA. Oh, and so if you, have a, a, if you have cancer, they biopsy your tumor, and traditional molecular DNA typically comes up with about a 15% rate of therapeutic leads. So we okay. sequence your DNA, and about 15% of the time they can say, oh, here's a drug. For the pediatric cases, it's all RNA, and they've been able to come up with the recommendations 100% of the time using only RNA and typically three to four therapeutic leads. So it's wow. radically so, revolutionary. Fantastic. Yeah. So in, in fairness to, to the other sequencing technologies, what they do is they make a, a copy of the RNA into DNA it's called reverse transcription, and then copy the DNA copy. So the advantage with our device is that you read the RNA directly, and all the little modifications on it that are abundant, you can sense those. Um, yeah. Take one more back. One back over there. Go ahead. You mentioned the breakthrough of the Apple II, the personal computer, mm -hmm. right? With the privacy concerns about my uh, DNA and the privacy concerns of the government now saying that having a DNA predisposition for a, yeah. for, for a, 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 mm -hmm. a, a cancer is a pre-existing condition, well, don't you see this as something that you're, you'll have in every home and you'll manage your own data and somebody will send you, hey, here's this new program for finding out whether you have something, as opposed to sending your data to 23andMe? Yeah, I, I, I think the, uh, the, there's a, it's a double-edged sword. So on the one hand, you can, people will be able to do their own DNA sequencing, even of themselves. But sometimes people can get carried away with information. They read their sequence, and then they go on online. And you go, oh, no, you know, because somebody has a blog spot where they're, you know, uh, something really terrible disorder like ALS. And then they, it just that feedback loop goes on. So having a, an MD to, to be the intermediary can be useful. On the other hand, 
you're right, it's privacy, but other things like imagine you're in your house and you're wondering, I wonder, I've been sneezing a lot, I wonder if there's a mold in here, a particular mold, and particularly is there a mold in here that's dangerous? And you just suck up the mold, some spores, and uh, put it on your little device and sequence it, and bingo, it's either benign or it's not benign. That kind of thing, I think, is a given that people will be able to do. The drinking water, too. The UC Santa Cruz also is involved in a global initiative called the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, 100 countries, 400 institutes. One of the things we're working on is standardizing the software that analyzes the DNA and RNA. So we're able, back to that treehouse group, we work with a hospital in Canada, and it's illegal to move the sequence between provinces in Canada, much less across the border. So we sent the analysis software to them, via a thing called Docker, for those of you in the room who are software engineers, and they sent us the de-identified results back. So it's highly likely that, yeah, all your data should show up in this, and the analysis will come to the data, and just the answers or the weights of a neural network will be what is emitted. Back, take from that side, back there. Hi. Um, so it seems that long read sequencing is the future, and um, it's getting cheaper. I was just wondering if you can comment on like what's this Roche is developing, like Genia. How would it be different from the? Oxford? Yeah. Uh, so so there uh, there is in uh, there's a variety of other nanopore sequencing companies out that are all in the, this Bay Area. Uh, Oxford Nanopore by extension because they're associated with us, but uh, all of them, uh, one way or the other, came out of UC Santa Cruz. And so there, there, there's a company called Genia that does nanopore sequencing by a different way. Uh, instead of reading the strand as it goes through, it, it basically does something called sequencing by synthesis as it copies the DNA. An incoming substrate is added, and there's a little tail on that, a leaving group that reports on the identity of that base. So I don't know actually how long a read they do. Um, I will be at a meeting next week where I'll hear, I think, about that. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. So you said that you uh, drill out that bore with electron beams, each one of those nanopores has to be... You can do it, so there's two ways to do it. One is to have a protein channel that just makes it. Nature made a protein channel that forms the whole, or if you're doing it in solid state, you use uh, an electron beam to etch holes in, in silicon, for example. And so that may, that's another leap into the future, is entirely a solid state device, where you put in a million of these holes and put in uh, sensors at each one of those. And then it's going to go up by orders of magnitude further in so principle. So how do you control the, the bore diameter? Is that critical? I personally don't do that, and so I can't tell you. Uh, <laughs> I do know that uh, the guy, a collaborator of ours at Harvard, who slowed down the speed of light to 18 meters per second, does that. So uh, it's, not, it's not trivial to do. Uh, they have feedback control, basically, for when the electrons penetrate the, the surface. We take a last uh, question over here, and then we can get to the uh, wine. You, and we'll Mark. be up here. Anybody can come up afterwards. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I had. Uh, one last question about synthesis. So you talked uh, about sequencing mainly, and before your talk we were talking about if synthesis could keep up with sequencing, we could get to some wonderful ideas for computer industry. Yeah. And is there anything that your science has taught you in the course of building these things that leads to faster synthesis in the future? Uh, that's a really good question. Let me answer the first part about data storage. People are now thinking about ways, people in the computer industry, to store data as DNA and read DNA, read that stored data, because it's so condensed. I mean, if you can put, the, the, the amount of DNA and information in any one of us sitting here is, is, is enormous. So they're, they're thinking about condensing information into DNA that can last a long time. People who study DNA from Neanderthal that's been around tens of thousands of years. And if it's stored properly, it is basically indestructible. So you can store information a long time. And then if you could basically read that back quickly and manufacture DNA and store it, you'd have uh, a very, very efficient way to store and read information. So I personally am not a computer scientist. 
And so I don't have an a, a, a answer for that other than it's a, a, a wonderful dream uh, and, and possibly, and I think likely real, real to do. One thing that's for sure going to happen is it'll be easier to store your DNA in amber. You know, you're, you get your blood sample, they take out the DNA, and they store it in little, you know, vessels, put it in something at room temperature where you can store it safely, rather than store your DNA sequence as bits on a computer. You'd literally store the DNA. It's easier. Sooner or later, it's going to be a lot easier to grab that DNA out of amber and sequence it. So that for sure is going to happen. Mark Akinson. Thank you.